video games have come far enough now that we more commonly see movies based on games rather than games based on movies. But while you're lucky to see a rubbish iPhone game from the latest blockbuster nowadays, there was a point when movie tie-ins were so prolific that many seeped through the cracks of pop culture and are all but forgotten about. So this episode is dedicated to uncovering those long forgotten films, those suppressed cinematics, and no, Peter Molyneux never worked on a movie license. Thank fudge. Just a game about the movie industry. But hello you, I'm Guru Larry, and I welcome you to Fact Hunt. Five movies you never knew had video games. Back to the future? Really, Larry? Oh, come on, give me more credit than that. I'm not here to talk about the well-trodden Angry Gamer staple on the NES nor the lesser-known MSX game that you occasionally see cooler reviewers cover. But for home computer port, virtually no one mentions. Electric Dreams Back to the Future port for the 8-bit home computers. Now, as with most home computer ports, it's a less action-paced affair, especially compared to its other two iterations. In fact, you can tell the publishers thought it looked pretty dull as well, as they thought the most exciting screenshot to advertise the game on the back of the box was a bloody loading screen. But obviously, you play as Marty McFly. A ginger Marty McFly. And your goal is to restore the 10 pieces of the photograph in the bottom right corner of the screen. You do this by luring your parents together, picking up books to make George follow you, the guy in blue with the pompadour here, and lure your mother, who follows you anyway, to the enchantment under the sea dance and give her a guitar to make her stop following you. But get your parents to meet enough times to fill the picture, and you've beaten the game. Of course it's not that easy. You've got to be as quick as possible, as your guitar will disintegrate as soon as the song ends. Because video game logic. And Biff in brown here will constantly punch you, delaying your rendezvous with Mumsy even further. Strangely, being attacked by Biff doesn't lose you any energy. The only way to actually lose health in this game is to be constantly touched by your mother when your dad isn't in the vicinity. <laughs> yeah, I'm not touching that joke with a 10 foot barge pole. But it is possible to recover your health again by locating Doc Brown, who has gone undercover in Hill Valley by cosplaying as Mark Twain. Overall, it's a pretty standard home computer affair. Confusing as all hell unless you know what you're doing, which wasn't me when I played it as a kid, but magazines at the time weren't too impressed. Your Sinclair only gave it 4 out of 10. A Sinclair user only gave it 2 stars. But in terms of unheard of movie licenses, it's one of the better games on our list. Remember Masters of the Universe? The live-action He-Man movie starring Dolph Lundgren, Courtney Cox and Mr. Strickland? Well, Gremlin Graphics were so excited about the premise that they snapped up the video game rights. Of course, this is a movie license created by a British developer in the 1980s, which means the game is entirely compiled by a bunch of low-quality minigames loosely revolving around a main one. And what genre would fit a He-Man movie license more than a Commando knockoff? Yep, the majority of the game has you controlling Dolph as he walks around avoiding the Blue Man group and picking up music notes. Which is an odd choice, really. I mean, why not be more movie accurate than having fine parts of the Cosmic Key, which actually makes the music in the film? Though, if you're after movie accuracy, you'll also have to ignore the whack-a-mole shooting gallery level. I mean, He-Man was all about the guns, wasn't he? As well as that scene where Dolph assaults a granny who constantly kicks him in the nads. Anyhow, find all the music pieces and you're off back to Returnia for an epic final sumo match with Skeletor, where you must constantly punch him in the throat until he falls out of the ring. Also, Skeletor seems to be cosplaying as Doctor Doom in the cutscenes for some strange reason. So what did magazines think of He-Man's live action adaptation? Well, pretty much everyone gave it 7 out of 10. Apart from our friends at Ace, giving it their usual nonsensical score of the high 300s but then interviewed Gremlin, who admitted the game would have been better if they put more money into it, 
and they didn't want to make the game in the first place. Honesty from a game publisher? Yeah, I'm just as gobsmacked as you! If ever there was a game that should have had LGN's grubby little mitts all over it on our list, it would have been Suburban Commando, the 1991 sci-fi comedy starring everyone's favourite gawker slaughtering slaphead, Hulk Hogan. Here he is on the title screen, trying to pinch one out. To briefly recap the movie, Hogan plays space… whatever, Shep Ramsey who has to defend Doc Brown's family from The Undertaker and this other bloke after he goes into hiding on Earth. Unfortunately, Alternative Software, the developer of the video game adaptation, completely ignored this finely crafted piece of cinematic perfection and instead base levels on the most random scenes from the film imaginable when they released their home computer version two years later. I mean, remember that scene where Shep is trying to locate his freeze gun? Well, let's base an entire level just on that, with a bank robber as a boss. And what about that prologue scene of Shep flying his spaceship and infiltrating the villain's enemy base? Well, let's dedicate half the bloody game to that, with a five minute long shoot em up level added for good measure. Because, again, we can't have a British developed movie licence without its obligatory crap minigame now, can we? Now, if this sounds like I'm ragging on the game, that's because I am. My inflections should have been evident enough of that. But Suburban Commando is short. Really, really short. In fact, there's only four levels in the entire game, and I've just described three of them to you. You can complete the entire game in less than 40 minutes. And this was a full-priced Amiga game. In case you're wondering, the other level, which is actually the final one, is Shep going towards the old nightclub where he stowed his spaceship via a construction site for some reason. Now if it wasn't for its length, it would have been a pretty decent platformer. In fact, much better than the Super Nintendo movie license shovelware at the time that THQ and High Tech palmed off. But even magazines at the time thought otherwise. Amiga Format awarded it just 23%, though everyone else scored the game in the mid 50s, so maybe they were just being twats. As you've probably noticed by now, all the movies covered so far were released in the 80s or the 90s, and all the games are nearly all European exclusives. So is there anything a little more recent and international, I hear you ask? Well obviously, yes there is as you've just read the segment title. Men in Black Alien Crisis, a 2012 Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 game, released to coincide with a third movie in the Men in Black series that starred Will Smith and one of the California Raisins. But rather than go along with the plot of the movie, which is a shame as the third film was pretty awesome, Activision thought screw that and came up with a much better one about a rookie MIB agent by the name of Agent P, an ex-thief who unwittingly steals a book that can take over the world but gets double crossed by the Mark Zuckerberg type media mogul he stole it for, and is now hired by the MIB to retrieve it as all the other agents have been turned to stone. While this sounds kinda like an interesting premise for a game, well alright no it doesn't, let me stop you there and say three words. On Rails Shooter. <laughs> yeah it killed all interest there didn't it? You see, when a game was released as an on rail shooter in this day and age, it's the publisher actually saying they blew all the money on buying the license, wanted to make a third person shooter, but ended up cobbling together an ultra restrictive pile of arse as they didn't have the money to make it work and wanted it out the door while the property was still relevant. Same thing happened two years later with that Rambo video game that everyone freaked out over them doing. Just when Activision did it with Men in Black, no one gave a toss. The press at the time absolutely despised it as the Metacritic average is 1.6 out of 10. The user reviews would have been the same if it wasn't for this fool here who gave it 10 out of 10. But who knows, maybe he's right and I'm wrong. But let's agree to disagree. <laughs>
Oh, shut up. If ever there was a game that, amazingly, had gone under the radar of every single top 10 worst movie license list, and that includes the one Wes and I made on TV years ago, it would be Akira for the Commodore Amiga and CD32. Loosely based on Katsuhiro Otomo's phenomenal 1988 anime movie, and I mean loosely, International Computer Entertainment, or ICE, no, I've never heard of them either, decided to snap up the license seven years later and release it on a dying system. So we're already off to a good start then. And of course, as ICE is a British developer, we see, yet again, that it's being segregated into several crap minigames. For instance, one of the most iconic scenes from the movie is Canada's gang battling the clowns on the highway in an epic bike chase. But having a Road Rush-esque level was obviously too good an idea for ICE, as it decided it would be far more thrilling for Canada to drive as slowly as possible, picking up gas canisters and knocking over traffic cones. Then have his bike made out of tissue paper as a bloody thing will explode for as much as a fly farting on it. And then, for good measure, make the level as difficult as possible. In fact, the level is so hard and frustrating, most people gave up playing any further. Even magazines at the time had to beg the publisher for passcodes to see later levels as it was so unforgiving. But in case you are interested, level 2 sees you playing as Tetsuo who is trying to escape a heavily armed Lego factory. You're also armed with mine bullets in this scene, as making people explode was probably too accurate to the movie for them. But the rest of the level has you fighting ghosts, Benny from Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and giant matchsticks shooting fireballs at you. Yeah. Level 3 is a sewer level. <laughs> Fantastic, eh? Because everybody loves bloody sewer levels in games. But you're back to playing as Canada again after he's joined the resistance. Thankfully, it's a lot shorter than the previous level. Level 4 tags on straight after the sewer scene, where Canada and Key are controlling a flying supermarket trolley. It's a standard shoot 'em up level, but with an absolute ton of enemies to dodge, and everything can kill you. I mean, even the bubbles. And the final level completely forgoes the epic battle from the movie, in favour of Canada travelling back to the Lego factory and fighting a flying spaghetti monster instead, who shoots eyeballs at you. So yeah, it's not very accurate, or good. And magazines at the time completely agreed. Amiga Power reviewed the game and gave it just 16%, saying the only good thing about the game is that it comes with a free t-shirt. And CU Amiga scored it a little higher at 18%, but were more concerned about the unrealistic physics of a motorcycle hitting a traffic cone to 100 miles per hour in the game. You know, the same world that features hoverbikes, psychokinesis, and mutants. And you want to hear the strangest story about all of this? It was actually THQ who snapped up the rights to Akira originally, who planned to release the game on all consoles at the time. They commissioned ICE to work on a Game Boy port, and as part of the agreement, ICE would also develop and publish a version on the Amiga themselves. THQ agreed, as they had absolutely no interest in the system, but by some bizarre twist of fate, every single port was cancelled, except for the Amiga one. In fact, the only other Akira game released to date was the 2001 PS2 game Akira Psycho Ball, and that was only made to publicise the DVD release of the film, so we're well overdue for a proper Akira game. But if you ever want to be one of the cool kids in town, Try sticking a care at number one in your worst movie license listicles. As if I see bloody E.T. there one more time, I'm going to scream! It is truly one of the poorest examples of a license ever, and a criminal treatment of such a groundbreaking movie. Hello you. Thanks ever so much for watching. Be sure to check out the other episodes in the Fact Hunt series in the links below, or even subscribe if you want to be first to see new episodes. And if you want to be super awesome, check out my Patreon to help me make future episodes. 
but thanks for watching and I'll be seeing you next time. Tara for now.